hand corner so if we could just have a couple of yeses to make sure that you can all hear us both that would be superb um, but hello everyone and hello I'm... everyone <laughs> so hello for me and Ray oh. so the way we're going to yay people can hear us fantastic stuff so um as hopefully most of you are aware, Ray has just returned from a groundbreaking conference over in the US. So he's going to update you all on the weird and wonderful things that have been going on over in America and all of the exciting um, new research. Um, we're going to try and get his presentation uploaded, but that's what we were having trouble with. So you might have to bear with us. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the Igenis protocol, the nutrition protocol that supports the pairing prep technique of which Ray's been using a lot of it um, clinically for many many years and he would have taught you about it in your pairing technique course when you first signed up with him so I'm going to run you through that it should take about half an hour and then Ray's going to um, take the reins and um, tell you all about what he's been up to um, since you would have met him and the last time he was in contact so without further ado I'm going to kick off um, so hopefully um, you should all be well aware that chronic fatigue has many, many, many different factors involved in its etiology. It's a huge toxic load associated, persistent viral infection is often um, associated with very early phases of the um, onset of chronic fatigue and then ongoing seems to be problematic. Mitochondrial dysfunction is something that's increasingly being related to all sorts of chronic diseases and is also heavily involved in um, chronic fatigue. Oh, we've got two different things going on at once here. <laughs> um, so, then nutrient deficiency also plays quite an important role. Obviously, any nutrients that are deficient are going to impact biochemistry, metabolism, as well as antioxidant status. So that's something that needs to be considered. And um, we've got hormonal disturbance as well can play a factor, whether it be thyroid or adrenal problems that then go on to contribute to chronic fatigue and um, further instill fatigue symptoms. And of course, stress and associated complications often underpin and exacerbate fatigue related issues. So the Igenis support protocol that we offer is a nutrition protocol. It's a supplement protocol and we've been very careful in making sure that it's highly targeted and highly specialised. Everything that we do here at Igenis is expertly formulated according to the strongest clinical evidence and the strongest clinical science and the very early support of which Ray has been using long term in his clinic and hopefully many of you are as well was based on the findings of, of course, Professor Bazant Puri who saw that um, long chain fatty acids and specifically EPA levels are quite heavily impacted in chronic fatigue patients. So by providing those essential fatty acids and the other nutritional factors that are now part of our slightly broader approach to chronic fatigue, we can actually directly help with the elimination of the toxins, enhance immune function, help with mitochondrial repair and mitochondrial function, cellular communication is very heavily impacted um, through low levels of um, fatty acids and nutritional factors so we can help to um, support that as well. Energy metabolism is enhanced and supported with these nutritional factors as well as helping control and regulate any um, hormonal dysfunctions and calming and controlling the stress response as well as part of this targeted approach that we offer. So I'm going to take you through sort of an overview of the products involved, an overview of the science, then I'm going to go a little bit more into detail of the science and the evidence and the research that's been carried out that's helped us to develop this protocol and then as I said Ray's going to take over and talk you through more of the, the Perrin technique things that he's been up to. So there's three main factors to the chronic fatigue protocol that we now offer at Igenis for your clients and your patients. Um, the one you should all be aware of is the GEPA and that is EPA and GLA. So the EPA is from fish oil, the GLA from 
organic evening primrose oil. Um, and then we've got Vesisol ubiquinol, ubiquinol being the active form of coenzyme Q10. And then we've got homocysteine control, which is a B vitamin complex, which is involved in um, the metabolic processes and methylation, detoxification, and things like that. Uh, Janine, if we could hang off um, for questions until the end of my section, I'll try and answer all of those before I hand over to Ray and then you can ask, ask him questions and then any we don't have time for you can email us separately. So just as a quick overview of the importance of each of the individual components of the chronic fatigue protocol. The Igenis EPA um, Vegepa product is there specifically to give the body back preformed EPA and GLA, two very fundamentally important fats within cellular communication, inflammatory control, etc. This helps to support cell membrane integrity, structure and therefore cellular communication and also delivers really um, good support for the immune system in tackling viral infection and conferring antibacterial and antifungal activities. It's also designed to reduce arachidonic acid to EPA ratio and thus support the inflammatory process. I'll go into all of this in a bit more detail when I explain the science slightly more fully. Um, by supporting cellular communication, cell membrane structure and reducing inflammation, you get all of these subsequent benefits as well. So neurotransmitters are quite heavily impacted by inflammation as well as um, cellular communication ability. So serotonin, dopamine and melatonin, the neurotransmitters obviously involved in making us feel well and kind of at rest as well as um, helping us to sleep. They are all supported by this protocol. Cell signaling and communication is supported by this protocol and also the receptor density for neurotransmitters is supported as well, which subsequently increases cognitive function and sleep patterns as well. So, um, homocysteine control is the final, no, I'm lying, homocysteine control is the second product in uh, the protocol that we offer, and this does what it says on the tin really, it lowers homocysteine levels within the body, which are now independently considered a risk factor for numerous chronic diseases and high levels of homocysteine does correlate with chronic fatigue. And the way homocysteine impacts is actually by impacting the methylation processes which are again involved in detoxification, DNA replication, cellular functions biochemistry and a lot of the um, benefits seen by controlling homocysteine levels are through increased antioxidant production specifically glutathione which goes on to support detoxification and oxidative stress reduction. Then finally the ubiquinol supports chronic fatigue by um, improving energy levels through enhanced ATP production. There's obviously a very, very high energy demand in chronic fatigue. So the more CoQ10 and the more support we give to the mitochondria and the cell to produce ATP, then the more the body and the cells can keep up with that high demand. This in turn supports the organs which are heavily impacted due to the low ATP and CoQ10, namely the cardiovascular and skeletal muscles which have a very, very high energy requirement. But coenzyme Q10 specifically in the form of ubiquinol is also a very potent antioxidant, so really helpful in reducing the oxidative stress and toxic um, load associated with chronic fatigue. So there's obviously the, the free radical scavenging there that um, the antioxidant capacity of ubiquinol offers. So just up front, so that you sort of get this message nice and early, this is the recommended dosing for the iGenus protocol, we do recommend and it seems to be the amount that most people respond to in the initial phases of treatment, about eight capsules of the Vegepa daily for the initial phases of treatment. That's given in combination with one capsule of the Vesisorb ubiquinol delivering 
a therapeutic dose of 100 milligrams of CoQ10 and then three capsules of the homocysteine control. Now this duration of six months is very much dependent on the person, their level of response. Obviously you're doing this in combination with the pairing technique. So depending on the combined therapeutic approach, other nutritional diet, lifestyle factors, etc. that you're doing, you need to, to really kind of consider when it's right to start reducing dose. And I would recommend that once people feel as though there's a, a level of improvement that they're happy with and a level of improvement that you're happy with, that you start to reduce capsules sort of on a one capsule maximum every couple of weeks, ideally every month, and just reduce one supplement at a time. So if anything suddenly starts to worsen, you can pinpoint exactly what that is. But ultimately, we do encourage that with addressing all of the factors associated with chronic fatigue, progression, severity, and onset, that you can reduce the dosage of this down. So going a little bit more into the research, Obviously, given that it's chronic fatigue, we know that prolonged periods of fatigue are kind of the primary characteristic of this severely debilitating condition. But there are a number of other symptoms as well, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, namely poor concentration, decreased memory. I know many chronic fatigue clients of mine actually report um, brain fog, which is something that's very commonly used as a term in this uh, condition, but also physical problems as well. So most chronic fatigue patients will experience pains and aches of the joints and the muscles, as well as insomnia and quite often um, digestive problems as well. So when it comes to the importance of essential fatty acids, the viral infection associated with chronic fatigue can actually directly impact both your omega-3 and your omega-6 long chain fatty acid levels. In doing so, it then disrupts our inflammatory and immune regulation. So that obviously will go on to exacerbate symptoms of chronic fatigue fatigue because the immune response just can't repair damage, inflammation is in overdrive and that's causing more damage and it just gets um, to, to a very bad um, point in clinical symptoms. The other thing that's seen quite commonly which sort of affirms this dysregulated metabolism of essential fatty acids is high levels of choline within the brain of chronic and this is something that Bazan actually found and a lot of his early work was based on um, and high levels of choline is a very strong signal that phospholipid metabolism and cell structure um, is negatively affected. So in terms of homocysteine and CoQ10, research-wise, mitochondrial dysfunction and low levels of CoQ10 are consistently being observed in chronic fatigue, which will, of course, go on to lead to very low energy supply to any muscle within the body and any function within the body indeed, and this increases symptom load and severity. There's also very, very strong levels of oxidative stress associated with chronic fatigue, be that from environmental or emotional stress or toxic load, um, and that can actually directly block the methylation cycle, and this is why we see high levels of homocysteine in chronic fatigue patients. Obviously, the blockage of the methylation cycle, as previously mentioned, goes on to reduce levels of the antioxidant glutathione, which further exacerbates the oxidative stress problem. In addition to low levels of CoQ10 impacting energy and low levels of glutathione impacting um, oxidative stress because you don't have the antioxidants to control it, there's actually a shift in the immune response which can further exacerbate and I'll explain that in a little more detail in a moment. Okay, so delving slightly more into the detailed depths of the research. Every single factor that is exacerbated by a symptom or a contributor of chronic fatigue will on its own initiate and instigate fatigue and somatic related symptoms of chronic fatigue. 
fatigue. So any levels of inflammation within the body make us feel fatigued, immune related pathways that are in um, overstimulation due to viral load or anything give us fatigue. And of course, low levels of antioxidant means we can't repair damage from oxidative stress that we could quite naturally otherwise cope with. So we know that there are numerous factors that contribute to the fatigue and then obviously there are things going on in CFS that make it worse. Viral infection, as I mentioned before, the way it disrupts polyunsaturated fatty acid synthesis is through directly inhibiting delta-60 saturase, which is a fundamental enzyme involved in the metabolism of short chain through to long chain fat. So people who aren't having a diet rich in long chain fats, both from plant um, sources for the omega-6 and animal and marine sources for omega-3s and omega-6s are going to see that if their CFS etiology is based on infection from virus that this delta-60 saturase is heavily impacted. Because the capacity to create the long chain fats that make up our cell membranes and then control the immune and inflammatory pathways are so heavily impacted in chronic fatigue, this will have um, serious impact on the cellular communication capacity and the eicosanoids themselves that are derived from polyunsaturated fatty acids are not actually able to be produced and that's why it goes on to have those immune impacts. Um, going slightly more into depth of the choline side of things just for a, an understanding, what was observed in chronic fatigue was that actually the hypothalamus tends to be in overdrive. So you get this huge autonomic nervous system stimulation that just ticks and ticks and ticks. And the main neurotransmitter for the autonomic nervous system is acetylcholine. Obviously, if that's been pumped out left, right, and center by the hypothalamus, then you're going to need to degrade and break down and recycle that, at which point you get acetate and choline. Now traditionally um, when everything is in harmony within the body the excess free choline swimming around is mopped up by long chain fatty acids and shorter chain fatty acids and turned into phospholipids. So the choline plus the long chain fats become the phospholipids in your cell membranes. If you've got very very high free fat free choline. This is obviously signaling that you don't have the fatty acids to mop that up and is obviously um, a very clear indicator that something's going quite wrong there. So the choline itself being quite high within the basal ganglia and the cortex isn't necessarily problematic, it's what it's telling us that's problematic. So it's quite a useful um, biomarker of poor fatty acid status and metabolism. So this just uh, goes into a little bit more depth visually of the metabolism of the fatty acids to help you really to kind of see why this can be so problematic. So you've got your omega-3 pathways on the right and the omega-6 on the left. And the very first enzyme involved in this conversion process through to the longer chain fats that make up the cell structure, that do all of the hard work within cellular communication and immune control, require delta-60 saturase to actually be created. And you can see from both the left and the right columns there, the inhibitors of delta-60 saturase and the cofactors required for delta-6 to function effectively means there are so many different factors, many of which are probably quite common in chronic patients that are going to exacerbate any viral reduction in delta-60 saturase that's being seen. So B vitamins very important there from a dietary approach, getting good leafy green vegetables rather than relying on grains, but also um, magnesium, zinc and selenium very important there, traditionally dietary factors that we're seeing more and more depleted in modern um, modern foods. Um, and then of course on the left there the inhibiting factors. Many chronic fatigue patients may already be on a number of different drugs because of low energy levels they're likely to have poor 
nutrient status because they're craving foods that give them high hits of energy. Many are very good with their diet, but still they may just need that extra boost to, to reset whatever metabolic processes aren't quite going the way they should. So many of you might be thinking and have probably questioned in the past, why would we be using EPA only fish oils? And the reason, there are two major reasons, one being this arachidonic acid to EPA ratio. So on the, the previous slide there, you saw the omega-3 and the omega-6 pathways, but actually it's really these two that come into play when we're talking about controlling inflammation and controlling um, Ecosinoid and immune related response to viral stress load, toxins, etc. So, what we see is that although the omega 3 to 6 ratio is very, very important because of our modern lifestyles, because of our modern diets, EPA levels in comparison to arachidonic acid are very, 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 very low. So the arachidonic acid is the main driver of the inflammatory response. It also makes our cells very stiff, so it reduces capacity for effective communication. So what we need to do is directly restore EPA levels to balance out this arachidonic acid. Now DHA, although very important for cell structure, doesn't have the same interaction and the same relationship with arachidonic acid. EPA actually can a directly displace arachidonic acid from cell membranes, therefore reducing the pro-inflammatory eicosanoids derived from arachidonic acid. But EPA will also reduce the function of the enzyme that releases arachidonic acid into circulation. So it's a double whammy approach, whereas DHA doesn't have that relationship. We also see in um, supplementation that for some reason, I'm still not quite 100% sure why, but due to the structure of the fats, the concentrated fish oil fats in a supplement versus uh, just from fish, when DHA is present in the supplement with EPA, it seems to be preferentially concentrated and absorbed after digestion. So actually if you're taking an EPA-DHA combo, the cells are likely to be further reduced and depleted of EPA because the DHA will be preferentially um, concentrated and taken up into the cells there. The problem that that has is that obviously we're trying to directly increase EPA levels, so giving DHA is not going to be helpful for that, but also DHA being the longest of the polyunsaturated fatty acids is the one that's most prone to oxidation. So if there is a huge oxidative stress load within the chronic fatigue patient, then high DHA supplementation can actually further contribute to that. So that's why we focus on just the EPA and that's why um, Ray and many other of our chronic fatigue patients um, and practitioners have had really good results just with the pure EPA fish oils. So as I've explained at the top there, it's really, really important to address this arachidonic acid to EPA ratio, which in itself is a marker of inflammation, but this level of inflammation as well as this ratio directly correlates with symptoms of fatigue. So in addition to giving the preformed EPA, there's also GLA present in Vegepa, the EPA product that we recommend for CFS, and the GLA is derived from organic evening primrose oil, so it has all of the benefits associated with restoring GLA, which is a very good natural anti-inflammatory omega-6, but it also confers antiviral protection. It actually helps to inhibit viral replication by reducing um, viral DNA um, turnover, but also you get phytosterol protection and tritopines from the evening primrose oil, so that will further support immune function as well as reduce inflammation and um, give some antioxidant through free radical scavenging activity. So this is just a really quick overview of the importance of a good low 
AA to EPA ratio, the numbers are very similar to an omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Anything above three arachidonic acid molecules for every one EPA within the cell membrane um, is starting to put you at risk. And just to put this into context, lots of recent studies done um, in various different disease states, when they compare healthy controls with um, symptomatic people, they look at their AA to EPA ratio, and many of the symptomatic um, people are in excess of 20 to 1, sometimes even up to 30, 40 to 1 in terms of AA to EPA. But even the so called healthy controls are hovering around the sort of 12 to 14. So our so called asymptomatic healthy population is not quite as healthy as it looks. So the reason I mention this is just to be aware we are actually hopefully very soon going to be releasing a fatty acid profile test that will help you to further identify fatty acid deficiency within your patients, help you to understand better the level of support they need in terms of fatty acids and really approach the right fatty acids at the right doses for that particular patient. So moving on to the methylation cycle, um, this is really heavily involved in biochemical pathways, metabolism, as well as antioxidant and detoxification processes. One of the key things produced by the methylation cycle is, as I've discussed, glutathione, but it's also... Um, it also is involved in the production of methionine, very important amino acid, as well as cysteine. But S-adenosylmethionine as well is part of this cycle, is one of the products of this cycle. And that's very heavily involved in our mood regulation. So homocysteine is actually a signal that this biochemical pathway and cycle isn't working properly. So again, much with the choline, the homocysteine itself may not be problematic, although it is, which is for another webinar, um, but it's a signal to us that something's not going right. So the reason for this metabolic pathway to be dysregulated in chronic fatigue comes back again to the high oxidative stress seen and that as with the delta 60 saturase methionine synthase which is one of the key enzymes involved in that cycle is heavily impacted by oxidative stress so it creates a, a partial block in this cycle when there's high levels of oxidative stress present which obviously goes on to affect glutathione production which will further exacerbate oxidative stress load. It has been consistently reported in research that there's a very strong correlation between homocysteine levels and the severity of fatigue within chronic fatigue patients and also as an addition to that low levels of B vitamin status is also very um, common within chronic fatigue patients. And the reason why that's so relevant, you can see here, and my apologies for the formatting here, the software um, that we use to do the webinar didn't quite like this slide for some reason. So it looks a bit uglier than it should, but you can see just here that here's your homocysteine. Normally that would convert through into the antioxidant glutathione or through to good byproducts like S methionine and methionine. But all of these pathways and these processes require good levels of B vitamins in order to recycle this homocysteine and turn it into something useful and important. So the B vitamin status within your chronic fatigue patients is just as important as the fatty acid status as well. Um, as I was kind of discussing earlier, and I'd like to go into slightly more detail, the drop in antioxidants associated with oxidative stress actually gives the immune response a signal to change its target. So there's two different kind of main immune cell um, types that drive the immune response. You've got Th1 and Th2 cells. The Th1 driven immune response targets internal pathogens. So it will focus on 
bacteria, it will focus on viruses and anything that's sort of attacking the cell. So for chronic fatigue patients, this is a good thing. You want to be in the Th1 phase so it can attack that viral, persistent viral effects, infection associated. However, when levels of oxidative stress reach a certain point, the immune system shifts towards the Th2 driven immunity and this starts to target external pathogens. So this is focusing on free radicals, focusing on toxins. So it's very, very important to be targeting the oxidative stress and reducing toxic load, which is obviously something very fundamental to the um, pairing technique with the lymphatic drainage. So by bolstering and supporting the glutathione levels and oxidative stress through antioxidants, you'll be supporting the, the pairing technique and this elimination of toxins and prevention of the shift in immune response further to make sure the immune system is focusing on that any viral load there. Another thing that glutathione seems to be very heavily related to is the production of molecules such as carnitine and coenzyme Q10 which hopefully you're well aware are very very fundamentally important for energy production. So once again we're seeing this kind of everything's linked to everything, glutathione production reduces which ultimately results in a production of the very nutrients and um, molecules needed to create more energy. And of course any deficiencies in energy related molecules are going to result in weakness, debilitating fatigue as well as pain and of course exercise intolerance. So the final thing just to sort of talk about research wise is mitochondrial dysfunction. Now this is something that's up until quite recently been a relatively up and coming area of science but mitochondrial dysfunction now is being implicated as widely as inflammation in various different clinical conditions and it seems to be a huge factor within chronic fatigue and it's to do with low levels of the fatty acids again fatty acids are very important for the structure of mitochondria but also for mitochondrial communication and function and also low levels of coenzyme Q10 are very very common within chronic fatigue now coenzyme Q10 as I'm sure you're all very well aware is the main factor that is required by the mitochondria to make the electron transport chain work, to drive energy production and to create ATP which is um, obviously vitally important. And as I said earlier, people with chronic fatigue have a huge, 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 huge energy requirement and a combination of mitochondrial dysfunction, low CoQ10 levels are going to really, really, really make this um, a huge problem for CFS um, because they just don't have the capacity to ever get better. Um, so by replenishing those fats and replenishing the coenzyme Q10 levels it can help to address the mitochondrial dysfunction as well as um, top up the nutrients needed to allow the energy production. In addition to its role within the energy production systems, ubiquinol itself, which is the active reduced form of coenzyme Q10 is a very very potent antioxidant so it can add to the alleviation of oxidative stress but in addition to being an antioxidant itself because of the mechanism by which ubiquinol is an antioxidant it's also an antioxidant recycler so it has free it has free electrons available to give to free radicals to quench them and calm them down but also to give to other antioxidants that have been used and spent. So it's a double pronged support really with ubiquinol which is what makes it so important in um, managing chronic fatigue. So you can just see here a visual of um, how CoQ10 works. Basically there are two forms of CoQ10, ubiquinone, ubiquinol and it constantly flicks between the two so when it has spare electrons it will donate them to either a free radical or a spent antioxidant to allow um, control via reduction of oxidative stress and then it flicks back to the ubiquinone form then it will get new electrons 
which turns it back into ubiquinol. But the flicking between ubiquinol and ubiquinone requires selenium. So it's very, very important if you are using a ubiquinone supplement um, that selenium is present at good levels within your support protocol, which is why at iGenus we focus very much on highly bioavailable ubiquinol to make sure that you're overcoming any of those problems associated with low um, selenium there. So again, just a, a quick visual showing how this works. So the, the little green one here is ubiquinol in its antioxidant state, and it can either donate an electron to a free radical, therefore quenching it and preventing it from um, bouncing around and causing damage all over the place, or it can donate an electron or both to another antioxidant, so that would then mean that this antioxidant had two spare electrons to go on and quench further free radicals. And of course oxidative stress as a result of free radical damage is implicated systemically, so inflammation is going to be impacted and worsened. And pretty much every system and um, organ of the body is going to be reduced and affected in terms of function. So just to sort of recap and go into a little bit more detail now with the, the background of that science there, Vegepa is the tried and tested product. The combination of the EPA and the GLA means you get all of the fats that overcome the delta-60 saturase enzyme problems that may be associated fully restoring long chain fats which will in turn support cellular membrane health, cellular communication, integrity of the mitochondrial membrane. The various functions of EPA and GLA will support the immune system, reduce viral, bacterial and fungal load. Um, but then of course you're readdressing that AA to EPA ratio directly and unopposed by other omega long chain fat. So it can really get in there, get to work, fully level out this ratio and control the inflammatory dysregulation seen. In turn this will go on to protect neurotransmitter levels and support neurotransmitter function which will obviously help with regulation of sleep cycles and um, feelings of a general sort of well-being and cognitive function. So as I said we do recommend that initially you start patients on eight capsules a day and then slowly kind of progress down to whatever seems to be optimal for the patient. Now this graph just shows that point in a slightly more visual way that um, you can see across the graphs here there's four graphs next to each other and they were um, it was a group of otherwise healthy patients given various doses 12 weeks um, each individual gray line is an individual person so you can see that even at very high doses, there's still a very big, big range between what people are getting in terms of change of EPA red blood cell levels. Yeah, there is there is some feedback. Ray, did you play with your microphone? <laughs> it seems to be uh, suddenly feeding back on me. Hello. 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 I think that oh, right. that's better. Yep. <laughs> Don't I, touch I anything. My, I took my microphone <laughs> off. I took my microphone off. So obviously. Ah. Uh, oh, that's possibly why, because then the computer was picking up my voice twice. Oh, Don't sorry. take your microphone off. I'm nearly done. I'm three slides no, no, away. No, no, because it's all right. No, no, it's okay. I didn't want to. I didn't want anybody to hear me if I was got, uh, drinking some some drink. Ah. Uh, uh, fair enough. Here. Right. I'm still here, everybody. <laughs> Good. Yes. Oh, we've I'm got nearly another done. Tender. We've got another attendee as Yay. well. Number 10, number 10 just us, Hello, know. new attendee. <laughs> right. So, very, very quickly then, homocysteine control. Again, initially go with the full dose of the three homocysteine um, to really help to readdress that um, metabolic pathway to make sure that cycle is supported and 
bring everything back into control, which will obviously confer antioxidant benefits, reducing oxidative stress load. Once again, steadily reducing the dose of the homocysteine control until we get to the point where things are stable and level and you don't see any recurrence in symptoms. And then finally, the Vesisorb Ubiquinol, an absolutely fantastically powerful antioxidant, vitally important for ATP production, protecting the type of immune response, um, cell-driven um, capacity there, and making sure that the mitochondria and thus the, the heart muscle are working efficiently and really providing the energy required to support the, the high capacity of energy needed. Um, just a note on sort of the dose with the Vesisorb Ubiquinol, as far as we are aware, and the reason why this product was developed is that Vesisorb Ubiquinol is A, the most bioactive form of CoQ10, but it's also the most bioavailable form. And there's actually a really nice study published um, today, I think it might even have been directly comparing ubiquinol with ubiquinone in mitochondrial dysfunction. It wasn't an animal model, so I'm not going to shout from the rooftops. Um, but it seems that the ubiquinol is definitely the way to go in terms of increasing CoQ10 levels. So um, hopefully it should give additional benefits over any ubiquinone that people might be using. If you are with the ubiquinone and you are happy, then do make sure that the selenium is in there because that needs to be there for the shuttling between the two. So the point I was going to make there was that for some people, although ubiquinol is super available, um, super bioavailable and ideally the, the best form, some people may just have such a high requirement for antioxidant and CoQ10 support that you may need to try two capsules of even the ubiquinol in this instance before you see things kick in and then when improvements start to show hopefully um, you can then reduce back down. So that's it from me. I hope that all made sense. We've got a lovely document that um, clarifies and summarizes everything I've covered today. So we, we will send that out to everybody afterwards so you've got it with you. In fact, you might have already been emailed it previously when we first um, started promoting the webinar, but I'll get make sure it's sent out to everybody again, and that will be something you can keep with you all the time um, just to make sure you are aware. The other thing to just remind you, for those of you who haven't read the emails and haven't known, the great news is is that we've updated um, your Perrin code. So Ray has given us the permission to um, make sure that the old one, which I can't even remember what it was, was it like VP8X something or other, Ray, something like that. Anyway, um, it's now Bones. So you can just give out Bones to all of your patients which should make it much easier for them to order with us either online or via the website but again we can send out an email after this webinar to uh, give you all of the details of that and make sure that you know um, how to recommend and, and what your clients need to do. So are there any questions? Um, immediately for me, there are my contact details as well as Dr. Nina Bailey's details, um, who's sort of very, very important in the development of all of these products and the nutrition protocol. So do please feel free to give either one of us a call or email us with questions. Um, if there are no immediate concerns or queries, I will hand you over with pleasure to Ray, who's going to tell you all of the wonderful things he's been doing. Uh, have we got the the um, lectures working yet? Are the lecture working or not? So I don't know Let me just see. My apologies, everybody, for, aha, yes, yay. Oh, we have. Oh, wow. we have. <laughs> oh, fantastic. So here we go. Do you like the new colour Can scheme? You... I don't know if you like the new colour scheme. <laughs> <laughs> I had enough of blue and yellow. Although, although I just had a patient in today who was a teacher, she said, we've been told that blue and uh, yellow with a blue background is the best. And I said, I've had oh. that for years, so I just decided that I wanted to change. So I hope you all like a new colour scheme, just for this one anyway. Okay, right. Am I, am, am I ready to go? Yes. 
Yes, you're good no, to go, Ray. No, Are you no, able? Just test that you can control. click the next button at the bottom. Let's just see. Does that work for you? Next, next, next is over there. Yeah, yeah it works. Good. Right. Okay. Okay. Fire away. Fire away. Right. Well, I'll just go back to the previous slide. As you see, uh, welcome everybody, all ten of you. Um, and uh, that I'll probably just go through it all and then wait for questions at the end, uh, if that's better. Or you can sort of chat send some questions if it's really urgent before but um, these are the latest findings um, uh, well it's latest findings from our perspective anyway um, the ISCFS conference um, was held in San Francisco but the day before that um, Stanford University who were, un who were under the also uh, under the wonderful directorship of uh, Jose Montoya. Professor Montoya is the head of one of the professors of medicine at Stanford. And Stanford, for any of you who don't realize, is probably, I would say, without, without I don't think it's got a, uh, anybody close to it, but I would say it's a possibly the, or I would say probably, the, um, the most um, advanced medical research establishment in the world. I, I think I can say that. They've got so much facilities, they've got so much funding, um, and they, they, anything goes really. Whatever they want to do, they'll do without even worrying about medical research grants and goodness knows what else. So um, Jose Montero runs the show, and um, he was a co-host for the international conference in San Francisco. But the day before, they put on their own symposium. And I went along to it with, together with um, uh, a chap I met in San Francisco. And um, we, went, we went along with a, few stu a couple of students who came from, from, who were, uh, in, from uh, Florida. And un they were under the guidance of uh, these two students who came with us in the car were under the guidance of Nancy Klimas. Now, Nancy Klimas is one of the top immunologists involved in ME. She's been involved in ME for 20 odd, 20 odd years, the same, uh, 25 years really, the same uh, time I have. And Nancy um, is um, with all the uh, hoo-ha a few years ago of the um, XMRV virus, uh, Nancy was caught up in it all, I think. And basically what happened was, she was working in Miami University and, and unfortunately lost her funding and lost her position there. And she was given the um, uh, wonderful um, 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 uh, laboratory in the South, what, Southeastern University in, in Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, and in the College of Osteopathic Medicine, of all, of all things. And they now host, host uh, some of the best research in the immunology side in an osteopathic college. So she loves osteopaths and um, she was very interested in my work. But let's go back to the beginning of this, uh, of this um, conference at Stanford. So basically, uh, sorry, next, there we are. Right, okay, so that was me. Uh, right, and this is Stanford University, lovely place, lots of palm trees and um, nestled about 30 miles south of San Francisco. Anyway, Jose Montaya hosted it, as I said, and this was uh, looking at the advances in clinical care and translational research. For those of you who don't understand what translational research is, it's basically translating research into clinical practice. It's, it's uh, the ability to use the research you get actually to make it worthwhile and actually use in the clinical practice, which we are doing all the time. We are doing all the time, hopefully. Okay, now, the first lecture of the day was Elizabeth Unger, and she was an epidemiologist. And it's very important we know the epidemiology of ME. There's so many different epidemiological studies going on, but this was the very latest. And of, co um, of course, it's an American slant to it, but it, it can show you the, 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 the size and the, of the problem. But anyway, what they found is that most of the ME patients they were seeing were, were 40 to 50 year olds. Most were women, and we know this already. They've got around three to four to one. So it's somewhere around um, three and a half to one, really. Um, and this is what we really see in clinic. Um, 
and we're seeing uh, and there's a reason for it which we've gone through before but there's even more reason for it the reason what we've always explained is because of the as you know with the with um, the work we've been doing on the lymphatics the the women's lymphatics in the in the breast tissue is much more enhanced and their hormonal system is much more complex and therefore any hormonal problem is going to have a major effect on the hypothalamus and the lymphatics obviously there's much more engorgement in the breast tissue and that's the main reason why women have a, have a problem with cement but there's another reason which I'll talk to you shortly about in the USA the highest, the highest in, in, in ethnic minority groups interesting enough and most patients are ill for over five years this not this is very important because you'll hear all the time from doctors who have very little knowledge of ME, oh, it will blow over in two years. But most patients are ill for over five years, and that's very important. And only 50% of the Americans, because it's all private medical care, seek medical care. And only 16% are actually diagnosed. So it's interesting that. Um, factors associated with CFS ME are three major factors, infections, stresses, and genetics. And again, this is what I've talked about all the way through my work, the different stress factors um, and the different infections that hit the patient. And of course, there's a genetic predisposition to it as well. Now, the first of major, major lectures was by Dr. Jared Younger, who's a professor of anesthesiology. I managed to say that because it's uh, what we call anesthetics. And Jared gave this amazing lecture, which I actually I had a bit of a, a hint that they were going to be talking about this anyway, because Stanford are famous for discovering cytokines in the brain in ME. And they found 13 different cytokines found there. And the most important one, and they were watching the daily fluctuations. And in, in Jared's um, lecture, he showed many different uh, slides of different cytokines, different inflammatory um, in, uh, inflammatory toxins in the brain that mimicked the symptoms of ME. So as the cytokines became um, more, prolifer uh, more, more proliferated, then the symptoms of ME worsened. And as the symptom, and as there was less cytokine uh, uh, profiles in the brain, the, the symptoms got better. So it was incredibly uh, how it followed. But the one that followed almost exact was leptin. Now, leptin is a prime, what they, he showed was primes the microglia more than any other cytokine associated with CFS ME. If you remember my work, I talk all about astrocytes, the microglia that, 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 that cytokines attack, and toxins attack these microglia, and leptin attacks these microglia more than any other cytokine associated with CFS ME. And this is what they believe why leptin mimics exactly. It's the, it's the microglia. Leptin is a mediator of long-term regulation of energy balance, suppressing food intake and thereby inducing weight loss. Now, in obese patients, it, you'd think that there'd be they're less leptin. That's why they're obese. But no, what happens is they found there's higher levels of, 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 of the hormone leptin. And it, because obese patients are actually leptin resistant, so it doesn't affect them. But what leptin does is it, 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 it uh, is a very attracted to fat and microglia are lots of fat, fat soluble molecules there or, or fat, fatty molecules that allow the leptin in. And what they don't understand is why the leptin stays there. Why is it stuck there? Why doesn't it come out? Well, all these cytokines are large protein molecules and they need the drainage. And remember the work that was done in, in Rochester University that showed that there was a microglial system, what, uh, what they called the G lymphatic system, proving that, that the, the perivascular space actually occurs. And this was discovered two years ago in Rochester. They didn't make the connection, but I went along after to Jared and I said, have you heard about the glial lymphatic system? And he said, yes, have you made any connections? And I showed him my work and he was over the moon. He said, this explains everything. And he then spent the next e evening having dinner with me, going through every inch of my work. And he was very excited. But basically, what they've discovered is that the, uh, the, the stages of leading to uh, ME in the, in the, with the, with the um, 
with uh, the leptin and other cytokines is that it causes a sensitivity in the microglia. It sensitizes it, it primes it. Microglia are maintained or hypersensitized to a prime state, they call it, and it's and then a triggering of that event happens, stress or infection, as we know before, there's the triggers. And it's interesting they call it triggering effect rather than the cause. It's not the cause, it's a trigger. Activates this hypersensitive microglia. The microglia then causes, a trans, it, it uh, changes into an activated pro-inflammatory state. So more inflammatory toxins are produced, which causes a more of a multiple, as they say, multiple pro-inflammatory excitatory and neurotoxic factors that lead to further and further and further toxins building up in the central nervous system and they interact with neurons around the body and then they cause all the symptoms that we know are going wrong with ME. Thus the whole of the brain that can be affected. But how do they stop it? And they don't know the answer to that. They can do and they can they can they can work on this on the on the triggering effect events, they can work on the infection, and they do antiviral, um, there's lots of work on the viruses, and uh, especially HHV6 virus, and, um, and Jose Montaya talked a lot about that, and they give, um, they give uh, uh, a, a different type antiviruses, like, uh, like, I mean, it's used in this country, acyclovir, they use a different type of anti an antiviral drugs. But the thing is, what they can't do is, is work out how to get rid of this, this, this toxic overload. And that's, that's where, I, where we come in. And they were really excited about my work for that, that point of view. The, remember what I said, that the neurotoxicity, the class of glial cells turns of astrocytes. And astrocytes are the main ones that are, are really important in these microglia. Are capable of phagocytic activity. This capacity is involved in the remodeling of synapses during development, but also may be a, used for engulfing foreign material and is essential in the brain's defense against neurotoxins. And all this I talk about here is, is directly from my thesis, so you should recognize it. You should know it word by word. Joke. Anyway, astrocytes um, are, are, are very important, and we know that the, there's um, that ATP, which is obviously important in in mitochondria is also important as a release, trans, as a transmitter, a glial transmitter. And these, this, the, 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 the glial cells need this drainage system to work properly. Otherwise, there's a buildup of all this toxins and all this rubbish that's uh, accumulating and nowhere to go. And therefore, as we say before, the astrocytes are crucial clearance of neurotransmitters. And if they're being damaged by these cytokines, we're in trouble. And as we know, this is the drainage points that we talk about, the perivascular space. Now, the, um, the um, paper that Elif showed, and he showed this perivascular space that he called perivascular, I put this into my, my, um, um, my poster for the, for the research. And it's interesting that um, they came over to me and said, what's the paravascular space? Is that what we call a perivascular space? Excuse my American accent. And I said, well, no, you call it paravascular. That was in your paper in America. And I think it's a typo because they call it perivascular space as well. So much for English and American. Anyway, so remember, large amounts of trace are observed in the basal ganglia and the thalamus. And you heard what Sophie said about that the basal ganglia are, are, are are, are shown to be affected when the, where, in the brain in ME. And the thalamus as well, thalamus is involved in sleep centers. The thalamus is, in, is part of the limbic system, the emotional side. And we know uh, this is all involved. And so many of the lectures talk about the brain, and there were quite a few neuro, neuro, neurological uh, neuroscientists there lecturing at, at Stanford, as well as in in, in San Francisco at the, at the main conference, all talking about basal ganglia, about the brain stem, about the, the, the limbic system and the thalamus. This came up again and again and again. These are the areas that are affected. So we know the basal ganglia is affected. This is the area that Ilif found in the, in the brain, of, in the brain of, of mice, and it's all around this area the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the, the basal ganglia, but more 
more important. The thalamus is, is important relaying sensory and motor signals to the cerebral cortex. The basal ganglia, remember, is important for, for making sure that all your higher centers have a control over all the things we do. They're the, they're, it's, the, it's, the, it's the junction box. And that junction box in the basal ganglia gets, gets, gets damaged by toxins, then you're going to have major problems. And this is what we see. And the thalamus, the regulation of consciousness, sleep, and alertness is affected. And then there came a most amazing lecture by two uh, neuroscientists, husband and wife, Mark and, Mar and Marcy Zinn. Now, Mar Mar Mark and Marcy, it should be Mar uh, Marcia or Marcy, they, in, in Stanford, have used specific New, uh, type of EEG and what they've studied is that the revealed their studies revealed that delta waves are much more aroused in, in during daytime in ME patients than non ME patients delta waves should be there for sleep for deep sleep uh, for the uh, for for the restorative sleep they shouldn't be coming up during the day but what it does, it, 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 call, it, it affects the awake cycle, uh, uh, during the awake cycle. And what it causes is, is, is a hyper, it, 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 first of all, it causes uh, an incredible sleep um, um, uh, fatigue. And then there's hyperarousal. And this is what they found uh, happens. So, the, the, so the, what we now look at is what happens during the night. In the nighttime, sleep We've shown in by the by the next study of Rochester. Remember last year they did the study on sleep, and they showed that sleep drives the metabolic clearance, and it's the hypothalamic locus carudus axis that increases delta waves. And we know from the studies of Charles Lapp, if you look Charles Lapp, and he was there lecturing again on, on different aspects of ME. They show that there's alpha wave intrusion in CFS ME. So there's less delta wave at night. And what Marcy and Mark Zinn have actually discovered is there's much more delta wave during the day. So it's a reversal of the normal patterns. And what, this, what was suggested by Professor Anthony Komarov, who was at the conference, and Professor Anthony Komarov is a professor of, in Harvard, uh, a professor of medicine in Harvard Medical School. He said, well, perhaps that the delta wave during the day is the reason why there's less delta wave at night. But Mark and Marcy are in said, well, we don't know. We've only done a day study. We've not done a night study. So it's interesting that there's definitely a dis 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 disturbance of this whole pattern. And what controls this whole pattern? And what controls it? What controls the delta wave? There's much more delta wave in, the, in this drainage in the, in the, in the, in the, in the um, mice. Delta wave sleep helps the drainage this is what they discovered and it's the hypothalamus locus coronius axis and this is what i discovered many many years ago and what i actually showed in my in my um uh, thesis and it's also in my book i looked at the hypothalamus locus coronius axis and i said it's this area that is so important in the drainage the, the subspinal fluid drainage into the, the, into, the, into, the, into the lymphatics. This is the area because the locus coeruleus is the, is the center of noradrenaline or what they call norepinephrine in America. And the hypothalamus locus coeruleus axis actually helps this drainage occur. It, what it does, it stops, if, 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 if the locus coeruleus is being activated, the, the actual drainage stops, it builds up, and then when it switches off, the drainage occurs. And this is all related to delta wave sleep. When the hypothalamus and locus coeruleus are active, you get wired and fired. And this is why ME patients get wired and fired at night time. This is firing off too much. When the, it switches off, they get this alpha, uh, uh, the, when, it, when it switches off, you get this delta wave sleep, which helps restorative, it's restorative sleep, it's a healthy way of sleep. And this is not occurring when the locus coeruleus is firing off all the time. So during the day, you get this wired and fired overactivity. When it switches off, 
you get the delta wave del delta waves coming in. So it's up and down, the dysregulation. It's a dysregulation. It's not too much, too little. It's just dysregulated. So we're seeing, it, we're seeing delta waves during the day when we see them at night time, and we're not seeing enough of them at night. And this explains exactly what's going on and why they're seeing this pattern. Now, I said this to Mark and Marcy Zinn, and they were over the moon because their EEG studies can't go into the brain stem and see the locus crudus. But Mark said to me, we absolutely can't, couldn't agree more. We believe wholeheartedly that the real driving force for this is in the brainstem and the hypothalamus and locus crudus is something we want to examine further. So they were excited by that. Now, my, um, they all had a copy of my poster, which I'm going to be sending to you shortly. Uh, um, and you'll all have a copy of that poster. And that poster combines all the different researches together that shows how we can recognize ME as a neurolymphatic disorder. So into the actual conference itself, translating science, again, translating, translational medicine science into clinical care. And that was in San Francisco in Park 55 Hotel, which is a conference hotel. And this was my, this was my um, whole um, uh, poster. Um, you, I said I will be sending an email to everybody with this in. So hopefully you'll see this soon. And this poster showed that, uh, uh, we, how we can look at ME as a neurolymphatic disorder. One of the most amazing things, before, before we had Peter Rose, sorry, we'll just go back to the previous slide. Um, this, I had 100 of these po um, A4s produced for the, uh, for the conference. They were all gone within a couple of days. They were so interested. Luckily, my poster had prime position just when you walked into the conference hall. So everybody saw my poster. But Jose Montaya, who co-hosted the rest of the conference as well, has, was so interested, he actually has invited me next year to go to Stanford myself and present my findings. So after the research is finished, hopefully in June, we finished June 2015, we start in June this year. I will be able to go to Stanford University to present the findings of the research, but also to show what, we, what I'm doing. And hopefully, they'll take my work a stage further and start doing some using their wonderful uh, facilities to look into the parent enemy. That's my hope and prayer. I'm not leaving you all. I'm hopefully going to still stay in England. But if they offer me to work there for a while, I, can't, I don't think I'll be able to refuse. But anyway, we'll see. So on with the show. Peter Rowe is, what is famous within the whole world of ME. He's, he's the top pediatrician probably in the world involved in ME. He's a professor at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. And he, is, he said to me, he's been following my work for years. And he said, you'll love my lecture because what he looked at was impaired range of movement and peripheral joints in the spine. And he showed, guess what? That in all the patients who had ME had thoracic spine dysfunction. Surprise, surprise. And he said to me afterwards, I knew you would enjoy my lecture. So basically, they've done a matched case control study with 48 matched participants, 39 female, the rest male. And he showed without doubt that they all, all the patients, there's a statistically valid, very, very major statistically valid st um, case study now that shows thoracic spine dysfunction in ME. Just what we discovered, obviously, years ago. If you remember, the thoracic spine was a problem in, in all these patients. Um, and it was a dorsal root ganglion as well that, that was a problem in, in, in that we felt was a problem. And dorsal root ganglionitis was talked about quite heavily. Um, I'll just go back to that. Was, was talked quite heavily in, 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 the, in their conference because they talked about the, 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 the fatalities and the two post-mortems done um, on Sophia Mirza in the UK that I've talked about before and Lynn Gilderdale that I also talked about and they did they had two postmortems both showing dorsal root ganglionitis and they talked about this in the conference about can people die of ME and they say they're keeping an open mind but they're saying that this is a, an area that needs to be uh, looked at so inflammatory toxins in the spine inflammatory toxins in the vein are very much the, 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 the buzzwords at the moment. There was a wonderful lecture from 
Dr. Jesus Castro, who, um, who talked about family aggregation in, in uh, studies in MEME, and they basically showed that 13% of all the CFS patients in Spain where they studied this, 13% of the patients had family history of ME. Some had five or six members of, the, of, of ME in the same family. And this is what I've seen for years. And it's so important because one of my patients, as I might have told you, is a, is a lady who's got uh, three boys, all with ME. And they are, the, the social services don't believe that three, pe three children in the same family can all have ME. They're thinking that she's making them ill. And uh, this study just shows all, all what I said. And I went over to Hezus afterwards and I say, although I'm Jewish, Hezus, today I believe in Jesus. And uh, he was very amused by that. And he, I said to him, you've got to send me your, your, all, your st all your information because this is going to save splitting a family up. And there is a case coming up soon to actually try and take the children into care. So a study like this in Spain really shows that it does hit families many times. And the American link to ME, obviously, we've got um, obviously Andrew Taylor still, and there's John Mendez de Costa who discovered the, the problem in the American Civil War. And there was talk about the history of ME for many years. And the, the, the real beginning in, of the International Association started when there was an, a break, uh, breakout in, in, in Incline Village in Nevada in, in the 1980s. So it started very similar times to when it was called Yuppie Flu in the UK. And um, there was uh, a lot of discussion about uh, the, the, the outbreaks and what, what it actually means. But they, they do appreciate that there's an, uh, an immune problem in patients with ME. And there's also a problem in, in, uh, in other areas of the, of the brain, like the blood-brain barrier. Now, I gave, um, after, the, um, uh, after the conference in, Amer in California, I went over to New York. And in New York, I was talking to them about the blood-brain barrier and how important the blood-brain barrier is in stopping any large molecules getting through. Well, the thing is, and as you see over here, the astrocytes take a major role in the blood-brain barrier. Anyway, the blood-brain barrier is important for, to stop neurotoxicity. Um, and if, new, if cytokines get into the brain and they co uh, cause problems, then they can affect the, the, the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, but involve in also, as I said, involve uh, damage the integrity of these glial cells, as has been shown by the work done in Stanford. The hypothalamus is obviously a very important role and the hypothalamus was mentioned numerous times as well as, as, well as, as I said, as well as other, uh, other areas of the brain that we talk about. Now, one of the things that was brought up when I was lecturing in New York, I know this is not the conference anymore, but this is very important. I was lecturing to a group of doctors who were osteopathic physicians in New York. And one of them, who is a, is a very well-respected um, physician, uh, Gary Ostro, he said to me, Ray, we really appreciate what you're saying, that, that the reason why that we know that the blood-brain barrier allows toxins in because hormones enter the hypothalamus in the, with, the bio, with the biofeedback mechanism. And remember, I've said that that is how we know that the blood-brain barrier isn't an intact barrier. And I use the example of insulin being produced by the pancreas, obviously, and then it goes into the into the it goes into the uh, brain, and it it affects the the it's controlled by the hypothalamus, and then messages are sent back to the to the um, to the pancreas, and insulin is reduced or increased um, accordingly. Well, Gary said insulin cannot possibly enter the blood-brain barrier. It's whopping. As you can see there, in Dalton's is a measurement of, of cells, of, of molecules, I should say. And it's 5,808 Daltons, whereas water's only 18 Daltons molecular weight. So how can such a huge molecule enter? It's impossible. So I went back to my computer, and I found two references. This is one of them. 
which is a study done in, 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 in King's College, London. There's also a study done in, 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 in New York showing quite categorically, although the, the, the hypothalamus does measure the glucose uh, levels, it does also have receptors for insulin. So insulin does enter the brain. It's whopping. It's massive. And this is so important for, for you to realize that therefore, uh, when I told them this the next day at the, the workshop, they said, well, the blood brain barrier is not really a barrier at all, which is exactly what I was telling them. It is a barrier. It does protect the rest of the brain a bit, but basically it's not a very efficient barrier. And that's why we need the neurolymphatic drainage. And therefore, all the time, with all the balance that we're trying to do, we're climbing, uh, we're patients are climbing this mountain on the tightrope, really, and they're ready. If the balance is not mechanized, as you, uh, uh, is not maintained, as you heard from Sophie, if the, if the homeostatic mechanism is disturbed, if the biochemistry in the brain is disturbed, if the cell structure is damaged, and if the immune system is compromised by, by, by uh, then and the nervous system is compromised the body goes further out of balance and then the body will fall or the sympathetic nervous system we need to be in balance as you heard the 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 you've got to have the epa and the the aa balance it's got to be exact and everything has to be balanced so we can have a sister situation where the hypothalamus is stimulating the noradrenaline levels and you have this wired and fired Feeling, or where it's crushed and there's no not much noradrenaline being produced at all and during the day you have this delta wave comes in and makes you absolutely shattered so that could be happening all the time remember that sympathetic dysfunction is supported by um and uh, by the the work of basam puri as you said that an increasing colon as you heard from sophie that acetylcholine breaks down and increases. Now, sometimes there is a reduction of, uh, of, 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 uh, of um, acetylcholine. And therefore, you, this is where it's slightly different. It's not overproduced, it's underproduced. And that's what I'm saying, the balance. And there was a study done by Chaudhry that showed that there was a lowering of acetylcholine in some, uh, in some patients with ME. So is it, is, do we need do we always need to, to supplement the, the, the choline? And that's, as Sophie said quite rightly, that as time goes on, you might find the choline levels balances out and we don't need as much. In most cases, as I said to them in America, in most cases, acetylcholine levels are upregulated. And in most cases that I've seen over the years, veggie PA helps. So that is the case. If you find that the patient's not responding at all, to veggie PA, it might be, and, I'm, and Sophie might correct me here if I'm wrong, but it might be that um, that um, that in that case, um, the um, in that case the patient's level of, of acetylcholine is quite okay, or it might be too low, and then 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 the the, the veggie PA might not have the effect we want. I don't know. Are you there, Sophie? I am, yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. I mean, everything in terms of sort of a nutritional pro approach specifically to CFS, it's very much an individual. So not everybody's going to respond to the EPA in the same way. So, um, yeah, certainly I would agree with that. Right. Okay, good. So now this is what you might find that some patients, I don't think it does any harm. I've never had anybody get worse with their GPA. But sometimes they might fail, hey, I've tried it for a few months. It doesn't seem to be doing anything. And in that case, it might be that they have to, they don't have a higher level of, 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 of um, um, a, a higher level of uh, acetylcholine. But one of the things that obviously that Sophie's talked about heavily is the glutathione and, um, and the methylation cycle. And this is so important. I mean, you know, with the work, we've had a lecture a few years ago, by, a couple of years ago by Sarah Mayhill, when she came and talked about that. I had the honor of meeting one of the founders, one of the person who discovered the methylation cycle, and that's uh, Dr. Richard Kunin. I don't know if you heard, have you heard of Richard Kunin, uh, Sophie? I don't know if you have. 
But he was... He the was name a, definitely rings a bell, yeah. Well, he was at the conference, and he came over to me, and he, he was really fascinated by my work. And he's, he's a I'm not surprised. He's a, nutritional, he's a nutrition physician of 30 years' experience. He pioneered the use of vitamins and minerals in medical diagnosis and therapy. He joined with Nobel laureate Linus Pauling in the founding of the Author Molecular Medical Society in 1976, and those two best-selling books, Mega Nutrition, a mega nutrition for women. So he is one of the leading authorities in the world in, in this field of methylation. And he was fascinated. He said it fits in so nicely with what you're, you've discovered in the brain. So uh, it's nice to get endorsement from somebody like Richard Kuhn. Um, so balance is everything. And, and this is the whole thing. As we're fin uh, finishing off, um, that we look at the hypothalamus, we, 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 uh, this is Lynn Gildedale, one of the people who we talked about had, had, uh, when she died, there was a post-mortem and she showed that she had dorsal root ganglionitis, as you remember, we talked about this before. And we, we also, uh, going through the stages leading up to ME, we, this, all these things now are, are, are being proven. Science is catching up to us. This is the thing. All the reasons for the, for the, for the build-up of stress, emotional trauma was mentioned a lot. Physical trauma now is talked about. Immunological trauma, immunologists have a field day. There's too many now. There's, you know, before they wondered about is there any biomarkers. Now there's too many biomarkers. They've got so many biomarkers that show things are going wrong immunologically. This is a big problem. Where do you start? And environmental pollution was talked about big time as well. Um, and, and, and America are leading the way in looking at environmental pollution in certain ways, and Stanford are doing some amazing work in that field. Um, so basically, um, the stages leading up to ME exactly mirror what they're saying. They're talking about emotional stress. They're talking about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. They're talking about the sympathetic overload. They're talking about sympathetic dysfunction. All these things they're talking about, what they haven't talked about and what we are is retrograde lymph flow. This is where we come in. Lymph is so badly taught in the medical world or throughout the world that they were so interested to know something about the lymphatic system that they didn't know before. And the physical signs that we're going to be researching shortly will, be, will, will hopefully, in the new research, will, will, will put us on the map once and for all. Um, the balance of the immune system was again talked about. They talked about the, the TH1, as we have heard from Sophie, but they, in, the, in the conference, they talked all about TH1 and TH2, and they talked about autoimmune. We had a wonderful lecture uh, all about the autoimmune, auto, autoimmune diseases and how ME fits an autoimmune disease exactly. And um, there, there's many cases that will have autoimmune problems. So. Balancing the autoimmune system is a, is a very important part of the, of the whole problem. Plant sterols, we know, help, and, um, and, uh, and I, we've talked about Modicare. And the, the uh, plant sterols, I don't know if, if, if we work, if Igenis are working on a plant sterile to help, um, but um, the, the... Not uh, in isolation currently, but it no. may be in our pipeline down, down yeah. the list. We've got so many things we want to make. It's one yeah. of the things... Well, well, there's, Modicare is a good plant sterile to use, and um, they, 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 they are very into it, into, interested. And this old osteochondrosis, this thoracic spine, as we now know from the work of Peter Rowe, this has now been shown absolutely to exist in many, many ME patients. There's a problem in the thoracic spine. And um, going back to the treatment side of things, remember the ME Association survey 2010? Well, I cornered Charles Shepard, who was the ME Association, uh, is a scientific officer for the uh, ME Association, and he amazingly had, um, was, was able to, um, uh, he amazingly was, uh, uh, was able to just ignore all the interest that I was getting, and he sort of said, well, we're not so sure, and I said, I said, Charles, your own survey of 2010, your own survey showed the parent technique right up there. And he said, well, numbers, I said, it's not numbers, it's, it's, it's proportion of, not. It's, 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 um, it's, it's, um, it's the percentage. And the parent technique had over 100, 100 respondents to about 1,000 people at the time using the parent technique. That's one in 10. 
and pacing was like one in one in one in a hundred respondents for that. So one in ten was a really high score. And he, he acknowledged that maybe he was a bit harsh and maybe that it is, is, is much more significant than he originally said. And he, he, did, he, was, he did soften a bit, which is very interesting. Um, and that was, uh, so he was there, but he saw the interest I got. And, and, uh, and again, I was telling everybody in the conference, it's not just the pairing technique. Pacing is so important. Cove factors, vitamins and minerals, and of course the EPO and the EPA is so important. And reduce toxins when possible. Toxins came. The, the word toxin was mentioned virtually in every lecture we heard. And the conference summary at the end was showed that the pathogenesis of CFSME is still obscure. The causes are probably multiple. The case definition likely covers several illnesses with similar symptoms but different triggers. Triggers, again, not cause. No tests yet have adequate, adequate sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis, which gives us great reason for doing our research and no proven treatment itself. But they did show that, there was, that this is definitely not a primary psychological disorder, that robust evidence of underlying biological processes that involves the brain and the autonomic nervous system, the immune system, energy metabolism, and oxidative stress, as you've heard today. Um, and that, that gives us rise to do our research, which is starting hopefully very soon at Wrightington Hospital. And balance is the key to everything. And I'm always finishing with my wonderful picture of my lovely Josh keeping everything balanced. So thank you very much, everybody. And I hope you, you got something. There's much more to be um, talked about. And in, my, in the conference, when, we, when you come in, in, in November to our conference, well, well, I'll be able to show you the whole slideshow of, of some of the lectures that, that were in Stanford. So that will be a, a, an extra bonus for you. OK, right. Now, can I just take a, 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 a short nature break and I'll be back in yes, two minutes. OK, please do. thank you very much. <laughs> bye bye. So I'm sure those of you that have, have managed to, to hang on until the end of Ray's presentation there will um, agree with me that, that was absolutely fascinating as a scientist myself that was um, really exciting and really interesting to read about um, definitely confirms a lot of what I've read about uh, chronic fatigue and hopefully a lot of what you are putting into practice um, as Ray mentioned you've got a wonderful Perrin practitioner uh, conference coming up at the end of the year so um, hopefully he'll let, he'll let me come, me along, come along be there, there as there well, as well. <laughs> Um, um, oh, I think Ray's unplugged, unplugged plug me. me. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so we'll, so have, we'll to have to go with, go with feedback, feedback for a minute. For a minute. But, but um, um, until, until Ray comes, Ray comes back, back, I just, I just want to say, to say that we, we will be offering, offering all sorts of support, support from now, now on. on. So, so do please, please keep an eye on your inboxes in 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 for hygienist related, related support. Um, um, and Ray, Ray will be emailing, emailing up you all as well. well. So um, hopefully, hopefully that, will, that will be good. good. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm so sorry, sorry about, about the end. Yeah, I don't, don't know what happened. Ray, Ray, Ray vanished, vanished into, into, into a stuff echoing. echoing. So, so, Please do get in touch with Ray, with Ray. Um, um, if you if have you any have questions, questions for him. him. Otherwise, I'll we'll see you all again, again soon at the net, net webinar. webinar. Take care, Take care of your own. Bye. Bye. Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm back. Sorry. You're back. <laughs> okay, you, raise that. Yes. If, uh. well, we're getting messages. Great, thank you. We've lost five five people. They've all gone. Yeah, I think 
I think everybody probably had to race off and go and make the dinner. But I have already said, Ray, that um, we'll be sending out emails and we'll be doing more webinars and follow-ups and catch-ups and things. And obviously, you've got the conference in November, um, which hopefully you'll let iGenus come along to, as even just as a participant, to have a nosy and see what you're all up to. Um, and yeah, yeah we'll, we'll catch up with everybody via various emails and webinars and things over the coming months. So there'll be uh, there's lots of support plan from um, yeah. Igenis well, with Ray. So. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I'll keep people updated on my common states because, I mean, um, I'm, apart yeah. from do, uh, as well as doing, as being invited to go back to Stanford, uh, I've also possibly going to be doing a joint seminar, uh, joint presentation at, at the Southeastern University in, in, in 